Hello, Anthony Gage, Disruptor of Dentistry. Welcome to another edition of Disruptor Discourses. And it's 18 years, well, it's my 19th year in dentistry. And I was just thinking back of some of the interviews I've had over the years. And one of the most fast paced interviews and one of the most memorable was 18 years ago with Larry Rosenthal. And at that time, lots of um, people against uh, veneers and chiseling off veneers. And we've come a long way since then. And today I'm excited to interview a disruptor, not of teeth, yes, of teeth, but also disrupting the workflow. And I'm excited to have with us uh, this month, Christian Coachman. How are you doing, Christian? Doing very, very well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor to participate. Uh, yes, we, we will hopefully have some fun here. And tell us where you are today, Christian. I'm right now in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, my, my home city. Um, even though I, I'm living in Madrid, I came for a, a few days to enjoy family over here. Now, shifting to the business of digital dentistry, can you remember the moment, the moment of truth, when you knew that your career would involve disrupting dentistry in a digital format? That's a, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, of course, it has been a constant uh, evolution uh, and uh, um, slowly, you know, moving forward uh, into this direction. Uh, but what I can say is that um, embracing digital was not about digital. Uh, embracing digital was a consequence of trying to be uh, more efficient um, and more profitable and more impactful. Um, I realized that it's not always about being better, but about being different. And uh, it's also about being perceived as different. Um, and uh, it's all about uh, finding ways to work with less stress since dentistry is so stressful, considered one of the most stressful professions on earth. So um, it, it, it started, you know, when I was a dental technician um, and that was my main job for 20 years, even though I was a dentist, I always worked as a technician for other dentists. And um, I just wanted to work less and make more money. I want being very honest and pragmatic here, you know, in an ethical way, delivering quality, uh, making patients happy, but uh, working with less stress and being more prof profitable. So I was always into uh, questioning myself, uh, you know, not accepting the status quo, not uh, just doing things because just, that's the way we learn. I was always asking myself, how can I do things better? You know, uh, is there better tools out there? I was always questioning, uh, what are the things that were wasting my time? You know, um, as a dentist and as a technician, what is wasting my time right here, right now? Even though I'm proud of my work, we're doing great work and a good percentage of patients are happy and we're doing, making this decent money. I was never comfortable with just that status quo. And I started to question, you know, and I started to make notes of what were the mistakes that were wasting my time and, and money? You know, what are the mistakes? What were the mistakes that were making my patients not more happy, you know, you know, mistakes that were holding them back and, and, and I started to make notes and I started to try to develop solutions to overcome these limitations. And at that time, you know, of course, every other solution was related to smart technology and, and 
that's the reason why I started to to learn and look after systems to make my life easier as a dental professional. So what was the biggest mistake then, do you think? Was there just one big mistake or has it been a, 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 an umbrella mistake with a few underneath? Yeah, I was able to, to bring it down to five, what I call the five main challenges of modern dentistry, you know? that were very real for me 15 years ago when I started this, uh, my digital journey or my DSD journey. Uh, and I see that these five challenges are still very real for the huge majority of dentists out there. You know, uh, challenge number one was how could I waste less time and be more efficient uh, making smiles in harmony with faces, the link between the smile and the face. Uh, the tools were very bad. The tools are still very bad when we talk about designing smiles in harmony with faces. Without digital, it's very hard, a lot of guessing. Uh, and that's the reason why the huge majority of uh, smiles that are designed by doctors all over the world with the best intention possible, but the huge majority are fake looking, are synthetic, are not in harmony, uh, are not balanced, are not expressing exactly what um, the patient uh, emotionally needs, you know? So uh, that was the mistake, number one. That was the challenge, number one. How could I become more efficient on designing smiles that are more natural looking, and more in harmony with faces. That was not number one. Challenge number two that I realized Sorry, was- Christian, can I just come back to the challenge number one? Please. So you've, you've just mentioned emotion. Yeah. And we won't go into, we all, well, we know that people buy through emotion. Yes. Yeah. Now, the the emotions that in dentistry especially the i call it the ffds so we buy through fears we buy through frustrations yeah. and we buy through desires yes now those ffds change with age yeah. change with treatment so the fears, frustrations, and desires are totally different for an Invisalign patient compared to an older implant patient. Definitely. So the younger the, the patient, the frustration is that they can't smile on social media, for example. The, the frustrated that their smile for the wedding day might not be perfect, and they have a desire to look great on the wedding day yeah so we buy through getting rid of that frustration mm -hmm. trying to get rid of that fear and mm -hmm. making that desire come true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now I, I notice with your courses what you're doing is you're introducing this process of creating engagement with the patient mm -hmm. and focusing on the emotions yes because a lot of people well a lot of dentists still think that they're buying the aligners they still mm -hmm. think they are buying the abutments mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in fact that they are there i've boiled this down and you'll probably agree with me mm -hmm. people are there for, for Invisalign, if you're young, they're there to have a, a straight smile to potentially get a, a partner. Yeah. When you're 15, you're having dental implants, you are there because you might want to get divorced. You, mm -hmm. might, you might be trying to keep your partner from going astray, mm -hmm. or you want to find a new partner. Mm -hmm. So it's all emotions. Yes. Yeah. So how do you, your courses, just mm -hmm. explain how you use the, the iPad, the DSD to bring out the emotion? That, that's a great topic. That's definitely uh, one of our passions to, to understand 
the psychological process of making decisions and um, uh, what makes people value more what we do um, uh, and gain the credits that we deserve. And uh, all these strategies, we actually call it emotional dentistry. So we coined uh, this term, you know, more around 10 years ago, emotional dentistry. And it's everything related to creating perceived value and influencing decision-making process and creating meaningful relationships. Um, and uh, this is a very important topic in, in our courses. So how do you first... Um, change the perception of dentistry that starts from there. You know, how do you as a dental professional start to make people understand that dentistry is not painful, not boring, or not only that, not uh, a waste of time and a waste of money. You know, all these negative perceptions that dentistry brings that makes people not want to go to the dentist. And I usually say that uh, most dentists, they only treat uh, desperate people or highly aesthetically demanding people. So either the person is, uh, uh, you know, in, in pain or are desperate by, for a solution, or the person is extremely aesthetically driven and they want the solution. But that is probably, I don't know, 10, 15% of the population, you know, uh, the huge majority of the population is not desperate and not in deep pain or not in extreme aesthetic demand. And, uh, and dentists are not trained to reach out to these people that usually have all the priorities in life and put dentistry in a very low priority. Uh, so it's all about changing the perception and changing the experience and making people realize that modern dentistry is actually extremely cool, you know, bringing the cool factor uh, we talk a lot about the cool factor and a, about how to, to make people perceive you as a super cool professional with a super cool team, with a super cool office uh, that delivers super cool solutions that will have great impact in people's life, you know. So uh, from changing the perception also uh, requires becoming a, a better communicator becoming the best spokesman of what you do. You know, doctors are not trained on that. Dentists are usually very good talking about dentistry to other dentists. Uh, but people that are not dentists, they think that that speech is very boring. You know, dentists are seen as boring professionals. Nice people, you know, doing their best. We need them, but they're very boring, you know, when you talk, when you tell people, you know, I'm a dentist, you know, people look at you like, mm, I'm sorry for you, you know, that's nice, but very boring. And I hate, you know, boring you know, things and boring feelings. And I was always about, you know, how can, when somebody asks you what you do for a living, how can you give the best answer that people will be like, wow, that is super cool, you know, and with the super short attention spam that we have nowadays you know you need to practice how to do that in a few seconds or a few minutes and that's something that we talk about on the course as well how to take advantage of that question what do you do for a living so it's about changing perception changing the physical emotional experience of a dental office you know if people hate going to the dentist why dental office look like a dental office everything that brings us away from that is beneficial. How do you become a better communicator, an amazing storyteller about the great things that you can do for people? Uh, how can you contaminate your staff with that passion and that pride and make the staff also uh, become great communicators about the great things that we can do? How can you change the experience on the first, second appointment, the core of our business, You know, the beginning of that journey? everything that happens until the moment that people say yes to your estimate, you know, what we call the pre-case acceptance strategies, you know. Um, and so it, it is at the end, exactly what you said, you know, we are emotional human beings. We think we are rational, but we are not. We are emotional. Uh, major decisions in life are emotionally driven. And doctors are usually very bad creating emotional connections because they're so focused on 
rational problems and um, being a good clinician. And that's great, you know, but at the end of the day, unfortunately, the connection and the growth will come by creating emotional links. And how far do you see, so two years ago when I helped launch um, Smile Fast with Gary Dickinson, Midian and Tom, which is the six uh, composite veneers um, and other um, systems. And in the advert, um, it was Anthony Gedge uh, is appearing at the courses and is going to uh, help you how to persuade um, patients to take on um, composite uh, veneers. Now, there was a huge backlash, you know, persuade. Well, if you have to persuade people, you must have an inferior product. <laughs> so it just all kicked off on social media. And mm -hmm. this, you know, dentists hate or the pretend yes. that they don't like selling and the pretend mm -hmm. that, that, you know, you said at the beginning, you wanted to make more profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of dentists hide uh, yes. with their peers. No, it's not yes. about profit. It's yes. patients first. But if yes. there's no patients first, there's no profit, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a, something that uh, it's like... Um, uh, how can you say, uh, you know, dentists have the, the this this thing with selling and persuading and marketing. And it's, of course, changing, basically, because I start the course saying, you know, the most successful dentists I know are not necessarily the best clinicians I know. Unfortunately, people making more money with dentistry are not necessarily the ones caring the most for the patient. Unfortunately, now, if you think, you care about your patient and you think and that you are a good dentist, you better move. You better move your ass and, and get to understand these, these games because success is lying there. And I usually start very strong on that to break these barriers, you know, and, and make people comfortable with these topics. And I say, you know, I started studying behavior and and started to understand better communication and body language and persuasion and storytelling because as a dental technician i was tired of working with great clinicians that were not as successful as bad clinicians that were making more money because they were focusing better on these topics so when i started uh, to work on these topics, my goal was to empower my great clinicians to become great talkers as well. You know, I wanted to save patients from bad clinicians that were great talking and bring them to great clinicians that used to be bad talking and now we're learning how to talk better and influence people. It's ethical persuasion when you know that what you have is the best for the patient and you know that many times you need to save the patient from themselves because they don't know exactly what is the best for them or they have a hard time envisioning the impact in their lives about what you have and how this can help them and you need to use if you look at your treatment plan and your suggestion and you do the ethical test of pretending this is your daughter and you say, I want to convince her. And if you do that test and the answer is yes, I want to convince her, you are approved. You are entitled to use your communication skills to convince the person about that option or at least educate and motivate that person to the highest level possible so that person can finally make a conscious decision about what they want for themselves. Yeah, great, great argument. The, the argument that I like to use as well is that when we, when we have complex cases, the majority of those cases are in need of some hygiene or perio. Yeah. And so I like to make the case, would you rather persuade her 
to have the aesthetic, but actually behind the aesthetic is gum disease. And if, if she doesn't get the aesthetic sorted out and she goes and buys a, a kitchen refurbishment or a luxury holiday, mm. you have failed to potentially save that patient from the oral systemic attached yeah. diseases. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And that, that, that's it, you know, yeah. that is it. Yeah. It's a, uh, uh, oral health is a very ethical product because uh, uh, everybody deserves to have a healthy mouth and a confident smile. Many people don't understand the impact of having a confident smile and we need to help them see that the impact of having a confident smile. And I always talk about confidence and not aesthetic perfection. I don't like perfect smiles. I like confident smiles. I think it's much more ethical to talk about that. Uh, modern dentists should be all about protecting or recovering confident smiles and healthy mouths. Uh, and there's so much to do on that aspect, you know, on, that, on this matter. Uh, and also ethical dentists, the ones that really care should be fighting against what I call the camouflage treatments. That is exactly what you mentioned. Uh, cute smile, but you didn't really fix the origin of the problem. You didn't really invest time to see beyond just the aesthetic part of the smile. You know, uh, you didn't invest on your education to understand what means modern interdisciplinary dentistry. Uh, regardless if the patient just want you to do one single tooth, it's your obligation to see the big picture and to identify and diagnose in a systemic manner and understand everything that can be improved and building a beautiful plan that explains uh, everything that can be done and then become a great educator communicator to excite the patient patient of changing their priorities and investing on this project because there's very few things in life that are more important than that health and confidence and uh, you know so uh, and run away from the cosmetic superficial camouflage treatments that we we think I, I use I, I I say this is a, a pandemic in dentistry, you know, camouflage, superficial cosmetic treatments. Because oh. there's so much more dentistry can do for people. Absolutely. So number two then, Christian? Number two, we, number two is treatment planning. You know, if number one is designing smiles in harmony, that's number one challenge. Number one uh, um, biggest problem the dentists are facing bottleneck. Number two is treatment planning, probably the most difficult part of dentistry, diagnosing and treatment planning. And I realized that is, of course, know-how is mandatory, you know, having experience to diagnose and treatment planning. But regardless of the know-how that you already have, I realized that technology can help us see beyond, you know. Technology can take your expertise as a diagnostician and treatment planner, and wherever this level is, technology can take you further. Technology can help you see better. Technology can help you communicate better. Technology can help you take advantage of one of the most powerful things when it comes to treatment planning, that is collective intelligence, not making decisions by yourself. And without technology, it's almost impossible to take advantage of collective intelligence daily. Um, so that's number two, you know, uh, I realized that I needed to invest in technology, not because I love technology, because I actually don't have, have no special feelings about technology and digital people think that I'm a digital geek or digital crazy uh, fan of digital, nothing. I'm not at all, you know, uh, I'm just pragmatic. I, I'm, I like to see the obvious and then take advantage of the obvious. So that's number two. Uh, and how are, you, how are you, you know, with artificial intelligence? 
So we've obviously got AI within ITERO, for example, um, Invisalign with their own treatment yeah. planning software. And then we've got Smile Mate and we've got dental monitoring. Are you, is there anything in the pipeline for you, for your own AI software? So we, we are a much more an education company and a service company than software development. You know, we do have our DSD app that is a simple smile uh, simulation and team communication uh, software that we own, that we develop. But besides that, we use technologies from all different companies. And every, every year, every month, you know, we are getting more technologies from different companies. And I'm constantly talking about uh, what I think is the best at this moment and what is probably what is coming next and so on. So it gives me freedom to work with all different softwares and, and companies and etc. cetera. Uh, of course, you know, it's a hot topic. Artificial intelligence is a hot topic, but, um, you know, people sometimes get stuck on what is a cool topic. And at the end, they take advantage of nothing daily. You know, doctors are talking about artificial intelligence. That is something that is still far from really generating a uh, 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 um, meaningful impact. And they get stuck talking about this fancy topic and they don't take advantage of simple digital solutions that are completely ready, super inexpensive, affordable, uh, that sometimes you can even take advantage without any investment, you know. So I like simplicity. I like to be realistic, to be pragmatic. I like to use technology that is available right now. You know, I know, of course, artificial intelligence already has solutions in place. You know, you have like Itero scanner that has an, uh, an immediate orthodontic simulation done by artificial intelligence. Uh, you have smile design applications guided by artificial intelligence. You have softwares now that are interpreting uh, analyzing x-rays with artificial intelligence and giving you some reports. Uh, but these are all super cool things, but are not the things that uh, will generate right now the biggest impact for your patient, you know? And there's simple things like transforming your phone into your most powerful digital tool in your office, you know? Uh, making your intraoral scanner become a routine and scanning all your patients every time, every appointment. Um, uh, utilizing 3D softwares to simulate treatments before you make mistakes in the mouth, you know, utilizing 3D technology to allow you to make mistakes on the computer and less mistakes in the mouth. These are things that are completely available and 99.9% .9 of the dentists in the world are not using these simple solutions that can generate an immediate impact in the quality of their services to their patients today. Cool. Number three. Number three is actually case acceptance. This is the number three problem that doctors have, in my opinion. They were not trained for that. And it basically, we covered this topic uh, in a few minutes ago, you know, talking about um, doctors are not trained to change the experience, to differentiate themselves, to talk in a way that patients are actually interested to listen. Uh, communication skills, charisma, body language, persuasion, uh, uh, teaching skills, uh, visual communication, how to use technology to translate your words into images, how to invest time on what I, if I, if I was a, a, the owner of a chain of clinics, for example, or a big clinic, I would invest, number one priority, invest time on training my doctors to translate ideas into images because people would buy much more the explanations, you know, visual communication. So, uh, you know, train people on visual communication and storytelling. This is for me the most powerful combination. If you have treatment coordinators presenting treatment plans, understanding how to express themselves through visual communication and storytelling, the business would go like this. So number three challenge that dentists are facing is creating perceived value, transforming real value into perceived value, becoming better motivators and educators, 
growing case acceptance, changing people's priorities. Now, I know that a lot of dentists, they, I remember studying Paul Homily years ago, and Paul talked about the, the head and the heart. And a lot of dentists dump data into the heads of patients and it drowns them with data and they become overwhelmed and they become swamped with information. Mm -hmm. And because they've got cortisol flowing, that cuts off all learning and listening. Mm -hmm. So when the patient goes to reception, they always say to the reception, I don't know what he talked about in there. And yes. that, that's the problem that, you know, the, um, the, the, the good hormones, the, the, the bad hormones, and, you know, to reduce the cortisol, to increase the serotonin, to increase the dopamine and the oxytocin. Um, you know, as soon as you meet a patient, we need to bring down, we need to get rid of the um, mm -hmm. uh, cortisol and we need to replace it with a happy um, yep. brain chemical. Yep. And people buy people first. And um, most dentists talk patients out mm -hmm. of treatment. Can you just ex expand on, on that? Yes, you're totally right. We, we share the same vision. I usually, I usually say, you know, the, you dentists, you are working very hard to convince your patient not to do the treatment. You know, you are mastering the process of moving people away, you know, from every little bit, every little detail of the experience, from walking through your door all the way to listening to you present the estimate of your treatment plan. Usually doctors are working against the process, you know, because we were not trained to actually understand this, uh, psychological journey that the patient is going through you know uh, uh, there's a lot of anxiety natural anxiety from the patient that be brings that becomes a big barrier you know uh, how do you slowly start to bring down these walls between the patient and the beautiful thing that you have to offer to the patient uh, how do you bring the patient you know, to calm down and, and really enjoy the conversation. I usually say, similar to what you said, you know, uh, uh, you know, at least two thirds of the interaction on the first, second appointment should be non-dental, should be non-clinical. The less dentistry, the better, you know. Um, how do you make people, you know, the strategies to make people trust you and like you, you know, that's the key. If you can, if you master the process of making somebody that doesn't know you to like you and to trust you, it, it, it's over, you know, it, that's what makes the magic happen. So what are the strategies uh, to make people like you and trust you in a few minutes, uh, in uh, a 15 minute conversation, in a one hour appointment? Um, that is the key, you know, and it's... Uh, the less dentistry in this process, the better. You know, people will, you're going to have a lot of time to discuss technicalities later. Uh, and usually after they already made the check, you know, uh, after, you know, and, and whenever we're talking about dentistry, uh, of course, we do need to explain uh, what we are offering. It needs to be an explanation that is much more visual and much more emotional, meaning you're going to visually understand something and you're going to emotionally understand the impact in your life. So you need to understand the emotional impact and the, and the visual technicalities of what you are about to, to, to purchase. And doctors yeah. don't touch the emotion and don't use visual. So it's, it's hard. <laughs> Yeah, but it's very hard. The, I cannot remember who said it, but it might have been L.D. Pankey or Bob Barkley. And they always said, get out of your patient's mouth. First, get into their heart. That's then, it. 
then get into their head. Mm. Don't touch the teeth before yeah. you've touched the heart. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's and, it. Um, Barry Polanski, the, the art of examination. Um, I've, I've interviewed Barry twice in a, a fabulous book. He talks about, you know, the, the examination is where you build the trust. Yes. And Agreed. he has, he has a, a, a 51 point checklist for the examination that takes 90 minutes. And uh, when I've interviewed, um, who was it I interviewed many years ago? Um, an American. Um, and he said, oh, not the, you know, the dog and pony show. You know, 90 minutes, it's, you know, it's just, you know, they just need to be in and out. And I'm like, well, you're missing the point of building yeah. trust, you know, yeah. conversation. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So number four, Christian. Number four challenge, in my opinion, that dentists are facing is the actual clinical execution with more efficiency and more comfort for the patient. So uh, I started to read to try to define what means a high quality procedure. You know, what means a high quality procedure? And I realized that nobody ever taught me that, you know, I have, of course, I had amazing teachers, but nobody actually taught me what means a high quality procedure, clinical procedure. Of course, there's the obvious, you know, the quality, the, the, from the dental perspective, you know, the biological quality, the functional quality, the structural quality, the, the aesthetic quality of what you just did, you know, that is very important, you know, uh, uh, of course, also the longevity of what you're doing, um, also impacts the quality of what you did, you know, how, how this is going to last and, and the impact long-term in people's life or what you're doing. Uh, but there is also a psychological factor, you know, how the procedure was perceived by the patient while you were doing the procedure, because you can do the highest level of a surgery, but the surgery took twice the time and 10 times more painful for the patient. And if you, the patient will rate that procedure afterwards and give a bad, very bad rating for that procedure. So I started to realize that many times, you know, dentists, they disconnect from the patient as when they are performing and they don't focus on the comprehensive analysis of a high quality procedure what you want is at the end of the procedure a week after the procedure a month after the procedure a year after the procedure the patient is, is talking and remembering that moment and say wow that was amazing you know you treated me and you know i'm talking to my friends and promoting that you're the best dentist in the world the procedure was amazing um, and then i realized that um of course it requires hand skills, clinical experience, everything that we already knew, right? That is very difficult to acquire, you know? It's very difficult to train somebody to be very good with their hands. And on top of that, have a lot of clinical experience. And on top of that, have the whole scientific background to perform something very, very good. But on top of that, I realized that digital dentistry helps a lot on that as well. When we talk about uh, planning the procedure in 3D before performing, it's like the pilot that is piloting the, the, the airplane, you know, several times on the simulator before he actually takes real people inside his plane. You know, uh, this is possible today and no dentists are using this. Performing the procedure in 3D, uh, questioning yourself, playing the devil advocate to yourself by analyzing what you're gonna do in 3D on the computer and strategizing the most efficient way, the fastest way, the more precise way, the approach, how you're gonna do this and prefer, prepare the team to be as uh, efficient as possible based on this technology when you're performing. So the concepts of uh, 3D treatment simulation, uh, guided dentistry, uh, digital quality control, 
uh, many of the, the names that we, we, you know, we brought to dentistry, you know, 10 years ago, we started to talk about these things and say, look, this is the benefit of using technology when you're performing on your patient. Uh, it's not about buying a CAD cam uh, just to say that you have a CAD cam or buying a 3D software. Uh, you know, you need to really understand how to take full advantage of this. And on top of that, you need to become an expert on explaining to the patient why it's better for them that you use this technology and then become a great storyteller about that because they're going to pay for it happily when they understand the benefits. So that is, for me, challenge number four, efficiency and better clinical performance uh, and how digital technology can help you with that. I was speaking to a client recently and he has you know nine associates and he said you know four associates are doing you know complex treatments and you know they're making the practice a lot of money and i asked him how long does it take for the six main treatments that they are doing and he didn't know so maybe 80% of those procedures are actually not profitable because yeah. they, take, they take too long. Maybe. Yeah, so yeah. it's quite interesting. This is an, uh, another thing that uh, I see that dentists are starting to, um, uh, to learn, you know, how to make these uh, business analysis or decision-making based on metrics, you know, uh, how to, you know, most of the, the, the metrics that we ask dentists to share with us, they don't have uh, even basic metrics uh, to guide their decisions uh, on what treatments they should promote more, uh, what patients they should attract, um, um, how to, to control the cost of the procedures, how is case acceptance going, you know, what is the average ticket price, you know, uh, are you charging too much or too little? Um, these are basic questions that I feel like a dentist, they definitely need a lot of help on putting these numbers together and uh, improving uh, the process of making decisions, combining, making this beautiful combination of improving the quality of care and improving their business. You know, this is what I love when they match they have to match. And your fifth challenge? The fifth challenge is a big challenge. The fifth challenge for me, the dentists are facing, is how to become a real leader and team builder. Uh, this is huge. You know, we know that dentistry is a team game. Modern dentistry is a team game. Uh, you cannot do high quality dentistry alone anymore. This thing that we used to see 30 years ago, you know, the dentist, it, that's not high, high quality dentistry. You can do that. There's many dentists doing it. But if you want to become a great dentist, you need to become a modern dentist. You need to work as a team, you know. Uh, and then when we talk about team, every single challenge that is related to team building. You know, how do you uh, hire the right people? How do you train the right people? How do you motivate the right people? How do you keep the excitement going, you know, year after year, you know, pride, passion, and performance, what I call the three Ps. How can you constantly nurture your pride, your passion, and performance? I think that's the key to longevity in dentistry. Um, and the... Uh, Pride, passion, and performance needs to be something that you as a leader are nurturing on your team. So the level of pride, passion, and performance are constantly high year after year. And uh, that's the key to work with less stress, with more joy, uh, to find fulfillment in dentistry, to be able to work like my father, 50 years and still work very hard and say that he could work forever while I see 
many of good dentists around after 20 years are trying to retire and they're tired and they're like, I need to find a different way to make money, you know? And I compare with people like my father that are um, working more than ever and loving it more than ever. There's something there. There's a magic formula behind this. And this is for me related to the three Ps, passion, pride, and performance. And uh, creating meaningful work by being very, very proud of your team and seeing how working in your office becomes their main career goal. So I think that uh, team building and um, high quality leadership is a huge challenge and probably the most important thing to succeed in dentistry. Great. Well, thank you for sharing those five, Christian. And as we now come to the close, mm -hmm. I wrote an article a year ago and I was asked to write an article for dentistry.co.uk on dentistry in five years time. Mm -hmm. And it had, I don't know what the numbers are now, but it was over 23,000 views. So it's a popular topic, you know, every, every doesn't matter what profession you're in, everybody's interested in the future. Yes. Predictions. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked to do a, a follow up on that article, but just some more long, longer term thinking. So dentistry, 2030 so nine years time so i'd like to put you on the spot mm -hmm. and i'd like you to close your eyes please and i'd like you to think that it's 2030 now mm -hmm. and the future is we know the future is um audio so in terms of alexa so now we can search by asking Alexa through verbal command, mm -hmm. you know, dentist in Brighton, mm -hmm. and it, it will bring up a dentist in Brighton. Now, if you can just think of how you, your um, workflow, how would you engage with, if, if, you, if you couldn't use your fingers and your hands, how would you engage with Alexa to move through the workflow? So is, is, is that possible to do? Could you talk that through? If you cannot use your fingers, how can you explain me better the question here? So let's say we're in we're in 2030 mm -hmm. and you have, let's say for example, argument said, let's say you've got a robot yes. and you are guiding the patient and the workflow through a robot mm -hmm. because I, I know for a fact that in 2030, a lot of the commands will be auditory. Mm -hmm. So it'll be Itero, come over here, and the Itero will wheel, wheel over. Yes. I, Itero, put the scanner here, you know, yeah. it'd be guided as, yeah. as well. Yeah. So I'm just trying to put you into the future yes. with the workflow. So does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's um, so. Of course, that nine years seems a lot, but it time flies, and and uh, you know it's cool to imagine uh, these super sophisticated things. You know, I think that in two thousand and thirty, we're gonna have some solid uh, modifications in the dental business. Uh, but of course, many of these ideas are just cool ideas that will probably not be completely ready at that time. Uh, what I can say about 2030 is that I believe 
that a couple of things will become reality in dentistry. One of them is the fact that there will be absolutely no more room for amateur management, zero room. So uh, we are um, on a transition phase uh, and dentistry is moving into, of course, corporate management style. And uh, since technology is gonna evolve, uh, systemic integration of dentistry is gonna evolve. Treatments will become more complex. Treatment planning will start to link many more dots. Um, you're gonna need more resources to uh, activate all these tools to deliver what patients will demand. So in my vision, what is gonna happen is that it's gonna be impossible for a single clinician to have all these tools, even the fancy ones that you just mentioned, you know, to have everything working. You're gonna to have to have uh, more resources and to have more resources, you need big, bigger structures. So you're gonna have the growth of uh, chains and growth of bigger clinics. Clinics will become mini hospitals and patients will go to these mini dental hospitals because if you have a bigger structure, you can have more access to all these solutions. So uh, the same way that physicians, when they finish medical school, they don't plan today to open their mini hospital. <laughs> they go work for a hospital. They become experts on performing on diagnosing. Uh, in dentistry, you have this mess up, messed up a situation where doctors, they need to be doctors, they need to be managers, they need to be leaders, they need to be owners, they need to be business uh, leaders as well, and they need to be everything. And, and it makes absolutely no sense, you know, and it generates a lot of stress. And many clinicians, they love being clinicians and they want to make decent money and have a great life being clinicians. And what I see is that in the near future, smart business people will create the environment for great clinicians to have a great life doing what they do at the highest level possible. So this notion that corporate dentistry and chains are low level will be, uh, uh, will be part of the past. You're gonna still have that, but you're gonna have a different type of corporations that will be the home for the best clinicians in the world. Um, and they will work with more pleasure focusing on what they do the best. And because of that, they will not have to worry to acquire and learn all these technologies because the business people will take care of that and make sure that they have everything in their hands. Uh, so uh, adoption of these digital solutions will grow because corporations, they did it in the past in many different areas and they're gonna do that in dentistry, how to use technology in a smart way to allow my clinicians to do the best job possible. And of course, be efficient and be profitable and, and so on. So I think for me, this is the biggest change we're gonna see uh, in, the, in this decade, you know, the consolidation of uh, professionally run uh, dental clinics, I would say orofacial clinics, not anymore a little small dental office, but an oral facial interdisciplinary clinic run by experts with high end technology and great clinicians delivering beautiful comprehensive treatments. Well, let's hope that the corporates come along to your course to learn about leadership and team building. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> there's a whole, I hope there's a whole new generation of business leaders coming into dentistry that will uh, be completely different to what we see so far because I, uh, I'm not here defending corporate because I think that DSD is actually the course for clinicians that want to keep stay away from this corporate where they want to keep freedom and keep their entrepreneurship so uh, I'm not in favor of corporate and I'm a big critic, critic of the way corporations are running dentistry. They have no clue what they're doing, 100% money driven. And since dentistry is so generous and such an amazing profession, unfortunately, they are already 
doing great money. And that's why they're growing, even though they have no clue how to keep motivation and how to keep quality going. So I hope that a new disruptive model will uh, enter dentistry when it comes to uh, the corporate side and the business side of dentistry. Well, Christian, appreciate your time. And Pleasure. anything, any final words, anything that we haven't discussed about the future of dent digital dentistry that you'd like to finish off with? You know, I think that, uh, first of all, thank you so much, you know, really pleasure. Uh, uh, I admire your work. I know we, we have many ideas in common and we, we try to support dentists in a very similar way. I hope that in the future, I will learn more about what you do and your work and that we will hopefully stay in touch and exchange ideas on, on, on all these topics. So it was a, a real honor for me here to share some thoughts with you. Um, and, you know, I think that um, we, we are living th through a very tough moment, as we all know, this is cliche and redundant to say, um, life is tough, dentistry is not easy. There's so many things that we as professionals, we want to achieve, you know. I just hope that more and more dentists will we enjoy the journey, you know, enjoy the journey day after day, uh, have fun with the challenges um, and prioritize the things that really matter. Um, be careful not to shift these priorities and uh, focus on your three Ps, you know, find ways to constantly reignite your passion find ways to constantly reframe your pride and find ways to constantly rethink your performance. And just this exercise of, uh, you know, finding ways to nurture passion, pride and performance, regardless of the financial consequence of this, because it will come, but just, Focusing on these three things, I think you see a lot of pleasure on the journey of serving people as a dentist. Beautiful close, Christian. Thank you for joining Disruptors of Dentistry. Thank you. My pleasure. See you.